Greetings to you out there in podcast world. This is Tony Denton coming to you again from the Phoenix, Arizona area on this very nice day of January 23rd, 2019. It's in the low 60s outside and bright and shiny day. Very nice. Something I'd like to do is begin a series wherein I dictate to you and I share some other side notes along the way from my book called Hebrews From Flaw to Flawless Fulfilled. Out of the three books I've written and published, this one is the most praised of the three. I loved studying for it and going through it several years ago. I went through it with PowerPoints and shared it with people, and I was told to put it in book form. So I did, and it has gone over very well. There have been several people who have ordered multiple copies in order to go through the book of Hebrews with groups of people in their studies. So I got to thinking one day that since I no longer have the PowerPoint series for this book, that I could at least do sort of an audio book of the book. I originally published it on my father's birthday, December 15th, 2011. I've updated it a few times since with the help of other people. And in the past year or so, it's gotten to where it just seems to be as perfect as I am able to get it. I can't seem to do anything else with it anymore. So after all the things that have been changed in it and not having anything else that I could find or anyone else could seem to find in the past year or two years, maybe even close to maybe even close to two years now, I decided this is a good time for me to do this audiobook. The book itself is divided into 37 studies. So I will do that with this. I will divide this into 37 podcasts. So it will take a while to do this because I'm not going to be doing it every day for several reasons. But I want to start off today with the first part. That would be the introductory material. By the way, you can find my book on Amazon, of course, or you can find just about every book on the planet. You can find it there or you can order it from me directly. If you do that, I get more royalty out of it because we're kind of bypassing Amazon. And I would love for you to do that if you could. I just can't take credit cards, but I can take PayPal or checks by mail, or you can send money directly from one bank account to another bank account through something called Zelle, Z-E-L-L-E. There are things like that that I can do, of course, and that you can do. I just can't take credit cards. So if you want to use your credit card, go to Amazon. If you can pay for it another way, it'd be great if you came through me so that I could make a little bit more off my own book and surpass that third party. So let's get into it. I'm on a preface page of the book in case you happen to have it and you're following along because I will be adding thoughts here and there as I go along just because that's the way it happens you know. In fact I hope that I don't come up with some great thought along the way that's not in my book that's going to make me want to go in and add it to the book because I really don't want to do that anymore. It's just a lot of work changing it and re-uploading the book and all of that. So, again, like I say, if you have the book and you're following along with these studies, great. If not, if you don't even have the book, you might really like listening to this as you commute or as you're doing yard work or something like that, whatever the case may be. Hebrews is one of my favorite, if not my favorite book of the Bible. I mean, it's just a wonderful book. I used to think that it was a really difficult book, you know, 15, 20 years ago and before that. I thought it was a pretty difficult book. But the only reason it was difficult was because of the baggage that I had, you know? So that baggage made it difficult. And then once I saw some things related to eschatology, how the Bible plays out with the system that God set up and how that it culminated in the fulfilled soteriology of the Bible and God and His plan of redemption and got the timing right with all of that, it made Hebrews an open book. I mean, it just became so much more clear than it had been before. So anyway, like I said a little bit ago, I'm on a preface page. We'll start with that now. And the question I have at the very beginning is, why another volume on Hebrews? Well, a casual perusal of the remarks on just the initial verses of Hebrews 
will instantly demonstrate why this work has been deemed necessary by many who have heard and read this material over the past six years. That is, as I was sharing it through PowerPoint and so on. I mentioned a little bit ago that I no longer have the PowerPoints. Well, I do, but they're old. I did not keep the PowerPoints up while I was updating the book, so there's not a really good match anymore. I wish I could redo those PowerPoints to make them match, to update them, but because they're on an old system, I'd have to start from scratch because the new PowerPoint program won't allow me to do that with the old program. Anyway, back to the preface. With the objective of performing a detailed study of this magnificent New Testament epistle, I have read and studied many writings and collected numerous bound volumes on Hebrews over the past few decades. From that experience, I believe I can accurately state that this exposition is different in its approach from any other bound work on Hebrews. Now, since this work is different, and it's so important to do this, I beg the reader to consult every reference provided within this treatise. Furthermore, it has become my conviction that the epistle to the Hebrews is the single most important piece of New Testament literature relative to an accurate understanding of biblical eschatology, that is end times, and soteriology, which is salvation. As long as the foundational theological information in this treatise is misunderstood, misapplied, and mistaught, long before interpreting the book of Revelation is ever attempted, God's people, we, will not enjoy the contentment that our Lord intended for us to experience. Hence, my prayer is that all who open this book will also open their minds to the approach employed that they, like the Acts 17.11 Bereans, may also be commended by their God for displaying such a life-changing attitude. Now, unless otherwise noted, the New King James Version has been employed throughout this book. Now, I will go ahead and read the next page as well, because there still may be something that will be helpful in the future from somebody in the audience for me and my work on the book of Hebrews. If any of my readers, or listeners in this case, discover anything in these pages, in these lessons, believed to be a doctrinal falsehood, please don't hesitate to share it with me for corrections in the next edition. It will be appreciated. In fact, much thanks goes to my son and author, Christopher M. Denton, and my friend and also author, Malcolm J. Neely, for their help in finding typos and other issues for me in the initial manuscript. Everyone else may email me via my website, a asiteforthelord.com, or at tedenton64 at hotmail.com, tedenton64 at hotmail.com. The next couple pages are just simply the table of contents, which is divided up into Hebrews chapters 1 through 13, and then into paragraphs, each paragraph being a lesson. So there's three lessons on chapter 1, three on chapter 2, two on chapter 3, two on chapter 4, etc. So that's why there are 37 lessons throughout my studies in the book of Hebrews. I spent a lot of time on each paragraph really digging into the passages written by the Apostle Paul. Yes, I believe the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews, which we'll discuss next. Okay, so let's move on to the introduction to Hebrews material, which is actually page one of the book. If you have an updated form of my book, it will have lesson one at the top, page one, and it'll say an introduction to Hebrews. That's where we are right now. The author of this magnificent piece of literature has been debated for centuries. Due to my own immense desire for at least some degree of certainty concerning the identity of this writer, I dove into my own significant investigation of this matter and have concluded that the Apostle Paul was the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Instead of relating the details of my research, I will merely convey a few of the primary reasons for my decision, leaving the reader to more of his or her own in-depth study if he or she feels the need for such. From the writing of this epistle itself, what follows are a few characteristics that may be determined about the author. Number one, like Paul, the author was a Jew. 
Note the first person plural in chapter 2, 1 through 9, chapter 4, 14 through 16, etc. Number two, like Paul, he was in Italy, chapter 13, verse 24. Number three, like Paul, he was close to Timothy, chapter 13, verse 23. Number four, like Paul, he was highly educated. He was a better writer than any other New Testament writer, in fact. Number five, like Paul, he was not an immediate disciple of Christ, chapter 2, verse 3. Confer that with chapter 15, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians. And number six, like Paul, he was very well acquainted with the law of Moses, quoting from it some 30 times and echoing it some 50 times. Now, it's doubtful that any Christian writer was better acquainted with the Old Testament than Paul. Check out Acts 22, 3 and Philippians 3, 4 through 5. There are at least 12 similarities of expression and thought in the book of Hebrews to the undisputed writings of Paul. For example, referencing the prophetic statement, the just shall live by faith, is unique to Paul, only found by him in places like Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11. Nobody else quotes it. And the ending benediction, grace be with you all, was used by Paul in every letter but not by any other writer. Hebrews 10 verse 30 in particular seems to clinch Paul's authorship because this exact same paraphrase of Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36 is also found in Romans 12 verse 19. For further information on this, consult James Burton Kaufman's commentary on Hebrews 10 and verse 30. Here's what we know about the author from sources outside this letter. A study of such will demonstrate that all of early Christianity attributed it to Paul from the beginning. In AD 95, Clement of Rome even quoted from Hebrews in the context of another of Paul's letters. Peter, who wrote his epistles to Jews, 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Peter 3.1, said in his second letter that Paul had also written to these Jews, 2 Peter 3.15. And no other known letter better qualifies for this statement than Hebrews. This epistle was sent out from Italy, chapter 13, verse 24, probably from Rome, where Paul was in prison for a while, perhaps along with Timothy, chapter 13, verse 23, and where it seems the only church in Italy was located at the time. This epistle was penned sometime in the early to mid 60s, just before Paul left Rome, chapter 13, verse 23, after his imprisonment there around AD 62 when he wrote his prison letters, but before the acute persecution that began in AD 64 under Nero reached them. For, according to chapter 12, verse 4, they had yet to experience bloodshed for Christ, which very likely would have happened once Nero came into the picture. This epistle's content and its title unquestionably establishes that the recipients of this letter were Jewish Christians. This epistle was written to prevent its recipients from returning to Judaism, chapter 2, 1 through 4, and several other passages I have noted here. This may explain why Paul didn't identify himself. Such a letter would likely provoke more persecution than he was already enduring. Besides, the recipients knew who the author was, chapter 6, verse 9, and chapter 13, 18 through 23. This epistle contains unanswerable proof for the superiority of Christ and his law of liberty over that of Moses and his law of bondage, thus fulfilling the author's objective. This epistle's purpose will be more readily grasped by means of an examination of its background, beginning, of course, with Jesus, its central theme. Jesus came on the scene fulfilling every messianic prophecy. The Jews in general rejected him as their Messiah, so he warned them of the impending doom of their idolized city and temple. In order to shut him up, they crucified him. But that failed because the church he promised to build was inaugurated within seven weeks after his death. The Jews, again in general, likewise rejected his church, which only induced her members to preach the same message of doom to their rejectors as did their leader. So in order to shut them up, the Jews went about trying to rid their world of Christianity. This persecution was initially led by the zealous Saul of Tarsus, who later became known as Paul the Apostle. Although some of the worst Jewish persecution lasted from the establishment of the church, AD 30, until Saul was converted, AD 34, Acts 9, 1 through 31, there was always persecution of Christians, especially Jewish ones. 
in one form or another wherever anti-Jesus Jews were found in their world, that is, the Roman Empire. Growing weary of the acute pressure to turn their backs on Christianity and return to Judaism, these Hebrew Christians, likely in Jerusalem itself, were privileged to receive a letter from Paul in this regard. Besides, there would soon be an even greater three-and-a-half-year wave of persecution once Nero, who is married to a Jewess, by the way, allied himself with anti-Christian Jews to eradicate all Christians. Since Paul, during the time of this epistle, around AD 63, was probably in Rome while rumors of this alliance were spreading, it's likely that he got wind of this ominous information providing him with even more motivation to write. And of course, logic dictates that if one is attempting to encourage persecuted souls, he doesn't reveal that their maltreatment is only about to become worse. No wonder there are six paragraphs of warning within this work. Warnings which become stronger as the letter progressed, from neglect to desertion. Number one, a warning against neglect in chapter 2, 1 through 4. Number two, a warning against unbelief in chapter 3, 7 through 19. Number three, a warning against carelessness, chapter 4, 1 through 13. Number four, a warning against immaturity, chapter 5, 11 through chapter 6, verse 20. Number five, a warning against willful sin, chapter 10, 26 through 31. And number six, a warning against desertion, chapter 12, 12 through 29. Hebrews isn't altogether negative in nature, however. In fact, it's actually more positive than it is negative. So in order to appreciate the positive context, consider the following overview outline of this impressive epistle. Now, it would be best if you could see this. In my just reading through this, it's not going to be as clear as if you could see the outline. But I'll go ahead and read through it anyway. So there are two main parts to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 28, where Paul dealt with the superiority of Christ's person and priesthood. He dealt with the superiority of Christ's person in chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, verse 13, where he dealt with Christ being superior to prophets, to angels, to Moses, and to Joshua. Then the second part of that is the superiority of Christ's priesthood in chapter 4, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 28, where he dealt with Christ being superior to Aaron, Melchizedek, and Levi's priesthood. The second part of the book deals with the superiority of Christ's pact and principle, chapter 8, verse 1 through chapter 13, verse 25. You can find Paul dealing with the superiority of Christ's pact, that is, the agreement or the covenant to Moses in chapters 8 and 10, where he dealt with Christ's covenant as having superior promises, a superior sanctuary, a superior sacrifice, and superior results. Then he dealt with the superiority of Christ's principle, that is, faith, to that of Moses, chapter 10, verse 19, through chapter 13, verse 25, where you'll find Paul dealing with Christ's faith principle as being a response to superior things, Christ's faith principle prompting superior actions, Christ's faith principle establishing a superior relationship, and Christ's faith principle being the basis for a superior way of life to that of Moses. Well, Lastly, in relation to our introduction and the first lesson, the key word of Hebrews is obvious. The word is better. Better is used 13 times in a book of Hebrews. Christ is better than the prophets. Christ is better than angels. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than Joshua. Christ is better than Aaron. Better than Melchizedek. Better than Levi's priesthood and so on. Just like the outline lays out. But there are two other significant words throughout the book of Hebrews. The words perfect and eternal. The original word for perfect is used 14 times, and the original word for eternal is used 19 times. Thus, Jesus and Christianity are better, for they grant a perfect standing before God, the blessings of which are eternal in nature. Okay. That's the preface and introduction to my book, Hebrews, From Flaw to Flawless Fulfilled. And I hope that this will be helpful to you as you continue through the series. 
I know it will be helpful to me to go over this again after so much time. So I appreciate you listening to these studies. And perhaps you can use these after I'm all through in studies with groups. It'd be nice if you bought a book for everybody to follow along in your studies, but you're still welcome to use these podcasts as studies for your groups. So next time, we'll move right on in to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, which just those three verses takes up an entire lesson because they are very important. There are only two places in all of Hebrews where I spend an entire lesson on just two or three verses, and this is one of them. So, Again, thank you for listening, and I look forward to anything you have to share in comments or questions in the YouTube comment section or emailing me or whatever it might be.